Welcome to another edition of Green is Good. This is the WebTech edition of Green is Good. And my co-host today is John Freeman. He's the VP of Global Partnerships and Government Affairs of GE's Water Business. And we're so honored to have back on Green is Good today, Henry Sharaby. He's the president and CEO of RWL Water. Welcome back to Green is Good, Henry. Thanks, John. Hi, John. Thanks. Hello, Henry. <laughs> you know, so we got the two Johns and we got Henry. Um, Henry, you know, for our listeners and our viewers who didn't hear the last time you were on the show, can you just share a little bit of your background leading up to the journey of becoming the president and CEO of RWL Water, please? Sure. Um, I had a chance of working with the uh, sole owner and investor of RWL Water, Ambassador Lauder, um, now for about 14 years. And uh, after I left in between and uh, pursued another graduate degree, Mr. Lauder decided that he wanted to get back into the water space where he was before. And uh, we back then lived in Maryland, and he said, would you mind coming back and helping me build, uh, build a structure around my, my ideas and put a water strategy together? And uh, I asked my boss at home, and she said yes, and we went back to New York. <laughs> gotcha. And, um, and now you're the president and CEO, and for our listeners and viewers out there that want to find Henry's great company, they could go to www.rwlwater.com, rwlwater.com. Henry, talk a little bit about what you're doing in the water industry. What's the biggest misconception today that's uh, surrounding the water industry as a whole? Well, what I believe is the biggest misconception is that water, and for the common people everywhere, that they think water is biggest... Uh, challenge is technology. I think right now we have any and all technologies around the world that can fix any type of water and make it even drinkable. The problem that we have is how to make it you know, uh, cost effective. Obviously there's always improvements we can make, uh, mainly for example for reverse osmosis or membrane technologies, the uh, energy more efficient and make it therefore cheaper. But it's not as if we're waiting for a breakthrough technology. I think we really have enough to work with and we need to come up with the best ways to get it to those who need it the most, which very often means coming up with financing options and technologies that make sense for the customer rather than one size fits all. Yeah. And you know my, my co-host today is one of the great water experts in the world. So, John, what would you like to ask uh, Henry here today? Well, you know, John, I'm, I'm curious why, I'm curious about you, Henry, but also why a billionaire known yeah. for a cosmetics industry, yeah. uh, why does he want to go into water? That's a good question, I think, and that's what everybody intrigued, is, is intrigued by our yeah. water, and I think that's one of our advantages, that we have a gentleman with his background uh, so involved in the company and, and founding it. I think the reason for him was um, originally that he believed that water is the oil of the 21st century, but he didn't want to make an investment because he could do that with a you know very highly traded stock. He wanted to do something that would allow him to do well while doing good, hmm. uh, that there was something that would help him to be involved in the Middle East peace process where water is key to the Middle East. He's highly involved in political discussions and meetings. And he really believed that investing in a mid-market water company that could really fill the void of helping those that need it the most and you know have a profitable investment while uh, solving the water scarcity problem was really the reason why he decided to invest. So, so you say a mid-market water company. What, what do you mean by that? So we look at projects normally that range in the EPC, so in the investment of, uh, volume, between 5 to $50 million. Now, great companies like GE Water and others that are the biggest in the, in the industry right. would take the wastewater treatment plant of the city of Chicago, ranging from a couple hundred million dollars in investment. Right. That's not for us. I think there you have very good, keen, strong players that we are not competitive. But if you talk about projects around the world where you have projects anywhere from desalination to brackish water to wastewater treatment projects in the five to 40, 50 million dollar investment range, that's really where I think we can play best and where we are also competitive against competitors like GE and the others. Are there a lot of mid-market players or is that highly um, populated right now also? There are a lot of mid-market players, but the mid-market players tend to be regional. So mm. you have very strong Asian players, uh. Middle Eastern players, or even U.S. players, but they tend to have a regional focus. What Mr. Lauder wanted to do is create a company that can do these mid-markets globally. Like a large company could do large projects anywhere around the world. Right. He wanted to create a company that could do large, not large, but medium-sized projects all around the world. And I think there we have really created a niche and have a scarcity factor that we are one of the few who can really do that. You, you mentioned pricing earlier. What, what is the pricing situation? 
What is, I'm sorry? Water pricing situation. Well, I think from, from a, you know, a point of use for the customer, I think water is way, priced way too low. I think we take it for granted. I think it becomes a political issue where uh, no politician wants to be involved in raising fees or taxes and increasing mm. the water price is perceived as such. Um, if you are a resident in Manhattan uh, and you don't own your apartment, but you rent it, then your water price is included in your rent. Anybody who knows anything about economics knows a good that is not priced accurately or is free is going to be wasted. Right. So I think we have a perception problem in the United States and, and many uh, Western and developed countries where water is not priced accurately. And the real true value is to those who actually don't have it at all and therefore cannot afford it and know how valuable it is. Whereas for us, we use it very generously and I think we shouldn't. Well, it seems to me that if water is underpriced almost universally, that would lead to underinvestment in water by utilities. And there would be an opportunity to come in and do something about that as a water treatment company. So what is the, what is, what's the opportunity and how do you bridge the economic gap that exists today? I think that's exactly right. There is an opportunity and that's what we focus, what we offer in that mid-market space, the project finance, right? The BOT model mm -hmm. where you allow the municipality or the industrial player not to buy the water or the entire system out front for 30, 40 million dollars, but you offer a 20, 30 year contract where they pay you for the water per cubic meter or gallon treated. And I think that's where the real opportunity lies, that not only do we bring the technical expertise and the market mm. knowledge, but also the financial backbone and capability to bring water to those who need it based on a different financing model. Is that different than the other mid-market of, uh, of uh, players that you're up against, do they also bring that financing model or is this something that's your special sauce? No, I think it's pretty unique to us on a global basis. Again, you have regional players that right. can do it, right. but uh, we are doing projects anywhere from Central America to Southeast Asia to North, South America, you name it, where we are able to offer beneficial terms to the customer from a project finance point of view or from a leasing point of view or a payment point of view, payment terms point of view. I think that's pretty unique to a company of our size and our space. Well, you know, when was this when was RWL Water started? So it was first started in 2010, yeah. and then 2011 is when we really got going. So it's about four and a half, five years old. You know, Henry, you know, on the business plan, we all know as entrepreneurs, business plans never are a straight line. How is it going now compared to, you know, how you thought it would be going and your boss thought it would be going? Where are you in, in the trajectory right now? So on some areas, as with the business, it's gone much better than we expected because it's, you know, it was on positive surprises yeah. and in some areas it's not. Yeah. I think the water industry in and of itself is an incredibly conservative business. Right. And so to bring new things to the table, two and three years ago, people would have said RW who? Yeah. And now we actually get a lot of inbound requests, whether it's for projects, whether it's for local partners. But four and a five years in the water industry is a nanosecond. Right. And so I think building this company now from a platform where we have a proof of concept. I right. We have partners like GE that we work with that right. now actually give us the time of day and talk to us. Whereas three years ago, I would have called John and he would not have returned my phone call. That's <laughs> not true. <laughs> <laughs> now I we, can't believe that about my co-host here. Oh, no, but, but now, <laughs> now I think um, we have a, a name in the, in the industry. We have over 7,000 installations in more than wow. 70 countries around the world. Wow. And I think that is what has really taken time is to get over the conservative space in the water industry. Besides having 7,000 installations and a, a record of success now over these five years, was also your timing really right in that the world is ready for this because of the need, the scarcity. As John has pointed out on other episodes today, there's nothing like scarcity that creates a hyper focus of a community, of a municipality, of a state. A city. Is this what you're also experiencing besides your record of success and the louder name, which of course has helped, uh, and financing, but is also the need now greater than ever in the world and the merger of the both is, is helping fuel the velocity of your success? I think it's absolutely greater than ever before, also by the boom of population around mm. the world. Mm. However, it's still not, I don't think, as we said before, priced accurately. Okay. So you can talk about timing and say, would we be better off in another five years? And I think absolutely. This is the f a future industry rather than an, a historical industry that will grow further. But give you an example, the United States, we didn't have a Southwest United States drought three, four years ago. 
we are now dealing with a country called Brazil. They never knew that they're going to have water scarcity problems. And now, you know, Sabespi, the world's largest utility company in Sao Paulo, is running dry in certain areas. So, yes, these opportunities are new. But still, to John's point, it is still not priced accurately. And that, I think, is a political uh, issue as well. So given your founder's role as a former ambassador to Austria, I believe. Correct. How engaged is RWL in the political apparatus around the world, trying to address some of these issues like water pricing? Mm. So um, Mr. Lauder is right now very active in New York at the United Nations General Assembly and uh, talking to heads of states and talking to leaders about getting more involved, about offering solutions, about saying, you know, a long international tender process should be made more precise, more concise, so we can go get to these projects and problems, because as you know, water is never a problem until it's an emergency. So Mr. Lauder is very much involved with that and uh, is trying to make heads of states aware that it requires planning, it requires foresight, but most important, leadership to get you where you have good water treatment for your population. Given that, you know, you live in Manhattan, Henry, but this is a global problem, where do you end up spending uh, the majority of your time on a month-by-month -month basis since you're, get, you're fielding calls and opportunities from all around the world? Where are you feeling the energy and the excitement around getting your uh, technologies and your company involved? So I think... Uh Thankfully, over the last several years, we've been very successful in Latin America. Mm. Um, we've had our two largest contracts in Latin America. Um, we've acquired, I think, a phenomenal company in Argentina. Um, so that's where we're spending some time. I think the U.S. market has a lot to offer, but it's obviously a very sophisticated market, a very uh, strong market where it's more difficult. And I think there's a lot of water scarcity in, in the Middle East. I'm actually leaving tomorrow night to, to Saudi Arabia. I think there's a lot of opportunity there, but given the geopolitical situation, it's difficult to sometimes to do business there. Yeah. So I was in Saudi Arabia in February, and what, what is the opportunity in Saudi Arabia? Is it around desalination? Is it around water reuse? What, what is it that you're, you're looking at? So I think desalination is one point, but I guess the largest market in the Middle East. So I see it more as a platform for the rest of the Middle Eastern Peninsula. But also I think we do a lot of um, uh, wastewater for um, uh, poultry and other food uh, and beverage mm. industries. And I think that is a real industrial driver behind mm. that um, to see how we can reuse that water. And uh, of course, energy prices is, has a different aspect in Saudi Arabia. But I think the industrial angle is really something that I would love to look at more. And uh, that's what we're going to take a look at. And what about water reuse in general? Is this something that you're focused on? Yes, RWL? absolutely. We're focused on it. I mentioned Brazil earlier. I think a country that's very keenly interested in water reuse. Um, we are we're using right now. We are, have a plant in Colombia where we recycle 80,000 cubic meters a day, and more than 90% of that is being reused for irrigation. So I think there is a reuse component of already, and, and I think, as you and I would agree, the only way to make smart use of water is to not dump it, but reuse it, and to not call it waste water, but value water. And you can given, really do something with it. Given water pricing, do the economics allow for this? Yes. I think they allow for it, but again, in, on an individual base, I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all, and a customer has to understand, and again, the leadership of the company Pacific Rubiales, for example, had that foresight, but it really requires ultimately a partnership with your, with your uh, uh, client rather than just a supplier relationship. You know, you mentioned uh, the poultry industry. One of the hottest topics now around the world, but for sure here in the United States, is the fracking industry. Talk a little bit about water recycling with regards to water process and treatment in and around fracking and the oil and gas industry, and what does the future of that look like? That's, that's a long, long way. It's hard to give you a straight answer to that or, or a short answer better. Yeah. So straight, we, RW Water, are not very focused on the frack business. Okay. I think there's a lot of opportunity, for example, in, the south, in the southern Texas, there's $3.2 billion of economic investment waiting for new water sources. So wow. because there's all this investment in uh, fracking, you have industries, aluminum, plastics, everybody else is going to build there as well and needs water plants. So that's what we focus on is the back end of that economic investment. And uh, we also do in oil and gas, obviously, uh, reduce the cost of deep well injection, which, as we discussed, is useless because you don't reuse that water, but use that water to reuse it for the oil and gas business, also therefore reducing their price on the per bar barrel of oil that they produce. So there's an economic model for the conventional oil and gas, and from the fracking where we're less so involved, we are basically piggybacking off of economic development in certain areas, whereas Marcellus Shale or uh, other places. Gotcha. Now, sometimes, Henry, 
the economics don't work. Yeah. And certain drivers come into play that still get communities or businesses to adopt new treatment technologies. And sometimes those drivers are regulations. Mm. And sometimes they're corporate sustainability programs. And what I'm wondering is, are you seeing sustainability programs be a driver for you anywhere in the world? I must say no. no. Again, I, th I think the company Pacifico mm. Bialis in Colombia was uh, had foresight and saw that without having an, a, a rigorous program, but the leadership there understood that that was the case. Um, no, I think ultimately it will be a combination of regulation and economics that will drive a real adjustment to price and to technologies and to adjust it correctly because I think if you ask people to do it out of their own will, goodwill, um, I think the, the, the process it'll take is way longer than we want it to be. It's interesting. I mean, in some places like Alberta, Canada, in the oil sands, you see tremendous re re recycling of produced water, and that's because it's driven by regulations. But those regulations aren't present everywhere. That's correct. You know, we're down to the last couple of minutes, Henry. What are your thoughts uh, on the future here? You know, what are you excited about? What gets you out of bed in the morning now with regards to the future of water and what's going on in the, in the water and uh, uh, infrastructure industries that you're involved with? What gets me excited about RW Water, and I can only talk very myopic yeah, from my point of, of view, obviously, is that we have come, gotten to the point where we are known in the market where we yeah. have really, really traction, where we are confirming our business model, where we have a lot of more projects, where we can work with companies like GE Water and others to have real partnerships and really bring solutions to the mid-market. Because again, if you build a very large plant, there'll be many tenders going out and easy to compete, quote unquote, or find these. But where you actually get involved from the beginning, you help develop these projects, you help the client understand the project, you help uh, put the financing together. That's what I get excited about because it proves that we have a real business plan. We have a real model that I think works. And I much rather have 20, $40 million projects than one $400 million project. And right. this is really the proof of the pudding that I see that excites me about what we have done and how much I think we will do going forward. Any final thoughts, Sean? Only that I'm uh, thrilled that there are passionate people like Henry out there, John, trying yeah. to tackle some of the world's most intractable problems. Thank you. That's Thank you, so great. both and of you. For our listeners and our viewers out there, to find Henry Sharby and his uh, colleagues uh, at RWL Water, please go to www.rwwater.com, rwwater.com. For John Freeman and John Shigarian, we are at the WefTech Green is Good conference here today. Henry, thank you and all your colleagues for making the world a better place. You are truly leading proof that green is good. Thank you, gentlemen.